Hello everyone, welcome to Boomer Tech Adventures presentation of memoir writing getting started with a focus on resources for memoir writing. This is a preview of an upcoming Boomer Tech Adventures course uh, developed by colleague Jill Spencer. Here is the BTA crew you'll get to hear and see today. From left, Jill Spencer, that's me, Ed Brzee in the middle, and Chris Toy. This was a live Zoom presentation in Maine Senior Guide's Cabin Fever Reliever event in late February 2021. Jill just started talking about writing memoirs and her interest in them. We join her in progress. Well, he wrote about his three brothers and he would write letters talking about his uh, youth in uh, Western New York State growing up on a farm in the 1800s, late 1800s. And uh, then his daughter, my aunt, also um, towards the end of her life, started writing her, mem her memoirs. And, uh, and I haven't read them all, but I've read through parts of them and learned uh, silly things like she married a young man from New York City and um, she was from um, an old, you know, Northeast New England family. Um, and he introduced her to garlic and they introduced garlic to the family back in Boston. And you have to know when I grew up, uh, I laugh with my friends who were Italian or Greek and I say, well, you know, we had salt and pepper and that's about it. And so the funny little things that I learned about my family and I thought, well, you know, other people have things to share. So I just thought it would be interesting and Ed and Chris agreed um, to put together something about ways to use the internet to help people write um, their memoirs or experiment with it. And so it's really not a session about the steps for writing a memoir. There are courses like that on, online, but it's about how we can use the digital tools uh, to help us mm -hmm. uh, gather information, um, store them, find um, ways to publish, etc. So that that's kind of where I'm headed with this. And as we finish, um, we're in the process of expanding this to a full size course. And I would be curious, we'd be curious about what other topics you think ought to be in that course, um, having to do with digital tools and memoir writing. So I'm not gonna call on anybody individually, but I'm wondering if at this point, uh, anybody would like to share what they're thinking about as far as memoir writing goes. I'll just throw it out there. Henry, do you have a comment? Well, this is, uh, this is strictly in response to your little story. Um, when I was in high school, I grew up in, on a farm in upstate New York. And I remember as a 16 year old driving around, I remember once picking up a hitchhiker who was an older man and he told me that he had worked at, the, at a dairy farm, which, which I knew, and that he was moving away because they ate garlic two or three meals a day and he couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> That's a true story. That's true. That's fun. Those are fun. Well, those are kind of the fun anecdotes I need mm -hmm. to put into a memoir. Anybody else want to share about their, their thinking currently about memoir writing? That's okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I am, uh, done. this is such a small group. Please don't um, hesitate to ask a question. Oh, the sun just went in, so my light, there we go. Um, don't hesitate to ask a question or add something uh, because this is really learning for all of us. Yeah. Uh, Jill. Yes. And um, I've been taking a memoir writing class from a a very close friend of mine who lives in Brooklyn, New York now. And she's a teacher, former teacher, and she and her husband are writers. Uh, and I, so I took a class with her um, in the fall and we got together again. We did like seven weeks. We, would, we, we could write on any subject we wanted to. Yeah. But she would, she would give us some pointers because she is a writer. And uh, we would get together and discuss. And I think there were maybe... I don't know there might have been 15 people in the group 
And it was, it was really interesting because it gets you writing. If I don't have a destination or if I don't have a time frame, I, I just, yes. it doesn't work for me. <laughs> yes. So it yes. worked out that That's we right. would write something every week. That's yeah. great. And I, I just wrote down writing groups because that's what you're in. And uh, I think that would be a great topic in the course. Yeah. How do you find a writing group or how do you start a writing group? Because I think you're right. If you don't have that deadline, and I think Chris will attest to that, he is a cookbook writer and his publisher keeps him right on task. Right, Chris, with uh, deadlines? Yes, it's, it's nice to have um, a a friendly motivator, um, but 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 full disclosure. In addition to my editor, I also have uh, my wife Joan, who is a who is a former special educator, and she has me on a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I often think um, Ed and Chris both have. Um, very active and very well organized wives and i'm thinking okay i need to borrow them for about six weeks to get myself organized all right so can everybody see my screen that says helpful digital tools for memoir writing anybody that can't see it okay looks like we're good so let's get going all right just in case you didn't uh notice the three of us in the uh zoom here we are so what I want to talk today or what we're going to talk about today is um, some, some stuff about researching, uh, some places and ways you can collect and organize information. Again, these are all digital tools. Um, a reminder about that if you have a smartphone, you uh, have a handy dandy recording device if you're doing interviews. Uh, a way to refresh your memory of the locales uh, because of course, you want your reader, whether it is a grandchild or you go to publishing, um, you want them to feel they're right there. Um, some digital tools that'll help you polish your work. And then uh, a little bonus on uh, a suggestion how you might get your feet wet uh, with self, some self-publishing. All right. So the first thing I had to do when I was thinking about this, I said, okay, uh, is a memoir the same thing as an autobiography? And so I did some research and I found, um, well, probably not, that uh, the autobiography tends to tell your life birth to the present. And uh, it just sort of goes along in chronological order. Whereas a memoir, uh, is more theme-based uh, with anecdote stories that help uh, support that specific theme. And so when I think of um, two of the most popular memoirs right now, one of course is Michelle Obama's Becoming. Now hers is a longer span of time, but everything she writes about is a things that led to her becoming who she is at the present time. John Bolton's The Room Where It Happened is very short. It's a year when he was the national security advisor for the last administration. And he also has a theme, which is foreign relations. And if you read it, it is, uh, you certainly get the sense that he knows better than anybody else what our foreign uh, policies ought to be. Uh, but again, he is sticking to a theme, as did Michelle Obama. So, whoops. Yeah, there we go. So um, I think the first tool has got to be the internet for uh, a number of reasons. So the first question is, well, what are the components of a well-written memoir? Uh, you might think you have background in that and that's fine. But if you don't, then you can do some research. And uh, I simply typed in components of memoir 
and up jumped right at the top these four links. And there are many more. So if you are a little unsure about what a memoir should include, uh, you can use the internet to research it. Uh, these are uh, fairly short, they're not long books, um, but you will get some ideas on what you ought to be thinking about. So I went through all these in a couple of, we went through all these in a couple of others, and we did create a little cheat sheet. Um, and some of the things that came up and everything we read about memoir writing included being very clear in your own mind what your theme is, uh, having your own voice so that it sounds like you, not like the person next door or not like John Bolton or Michelle Obama or whatever, it's you, uh, that you need to do your research because you want to be able to add those details that keep your reader engaged. And your research may be your own diaries, uh, but you might want to do some additional. Uh, you need to find ways to engage your audience. And it was interesting, a number of these writers talked about that we ought to think about writing memoirs as their novel, not making things up, but being a great story to tell that keeps people involved with dialogue and interesting uh, anecdotes. And the other that showed up in all the descriptions was that you emphasize the elements of your story that support your theme. You don't have to have every detail whether it's a year span or multiple years. But what are those details from your experiences that support your theme, whatever it might be? Uh, so for example, having grown up in the 60s, I'm thinking there are a lot of people in my generation who uh, were activists for a variety of causes. And um, they have great stories to tell. And so if they were telling their, writing their memoir, they'd want to pick those details that show how they were shaped as an activist and how that changed from their 20s to their 60s and 70s, um, which is uh, kind of interesting. I have a um, acquaintance, actually it's my nephew's mother-in-law, and she belongs to a group called Raging Grannies. And these women are anywhere from their 60s to close to 100. And so it would be interesting to know how they got to that point in their life, what, what experiences helped shape them. And that would make a great memoir in my mind. Um, anyway, and this little cheat sheet just uh, goes over some of those things. And should you want it, you can see the address there, boomertech.com slash memoir writing. And if you put that in, uh, you can download this particular little cheat sheet. Okay, now here's where the old English teacher comes in. Before we ask kids to write, and I think it would be true for adults, before we ask them to write in a specific genre, they need to read lots of examples. So they begin to internalize what a good essay, what a good science fiction story, what a good persuasive essay, whatever, what it looks like. And the same should be for us who are writing our own memoirs is we really ought to take some time to read memoirs and think, oh, all right, I know that these are the things I want in my memoir as far as elements. Uh, how do these particular memoirs measure up to it? And so online, um, I found uh, right off 10 online examples of memoirs and then 50 short memoirs, examples of personal narrative essays by famous authors. And that's what this over here is, that's the screenshot. And if you were to go to here, these are all live and you could just click on them. And so you see in this particular one, 50 short memoirs, they have organized it by theme, life, death, love, sex, relationships, education, having children, 
growing up, et cetera. And of course, you can also watch examples of memoirs. And I just was thought about the masterpiece theater, the Durrells in Corfu, which is a type of uh, memoir by the, the original author. So first two things is you really need to know what the components of a good memoir are, and then you ought to read some. Now, there are other sources of just article links. So for example, the New York Times has a family section, and often that has a memoir type thing. And the one here, Defying the Family Cycle of Addiction, there's the theme. Uh, Jenny Burke actually uh, was a young teacher in my school years ago. Uh, she has since gotten a master's in um, fine arts, fine arts writing. Um, she's also raised four children. So, uh, but she was published by the New York Times. So it is po possible for unpublished writers to be published by others. Uh, here's one, the Grizzly and Purple Pants. And this is a memoir about a stepfather. Uh, Huffington Post has the Huffington Post personal. You can read those. Washington Post uh, and other newspapers. These were just three that came to mind. Often will publish short articles. So again, you can read them very quickly and think, OK, this one has these elements. Boy, I think they fell short on this one. Uh, something for me to remember. And there's also something called the Memoir Magazine. And if you've never been there, you, all you have to do is, is Google Memoir Magazine. And um, it's what it says. It is published memoirs. Uh, and yeah, I know you can't read that, but in, um, in the yellow print, it, it has the themes in it. So take time to read some certainly before you start to write if you've already started writing read some anyway just to think about uh, the strategies that different writers use that you might um, borrow and make your own all right so then i thought research question number three you want to create when we write we want to create or it's nice to create some kind of context for the reader and how do you do that? Um, because things are not only going on in our own lives, but in our own local uh, towns, nationally, regionally, world events. And how can you put your reader into that situation? Going back to um, the activist theme, uh, unless somebody grew up in the 60s and early 70s, and saw the kinds of protests, uh, they might not understand why somebody in their 60s and 70s is still an active, active protester. Again, for whatever um, subject or for whatever cause that they might support. And so how do you build that context? And uh, so doing a little research, specific newspapers, whether it be your hometown newspaper, or in this case, I picked on the San Francisco Chronicle, they all have archives. And uh, you can search them. You can see I put in Hate ashbury I'm still on that activist theme or the, the 60s. And you see that there are a number of records. Now, some of the newspapers are free, and some you have to pay a small price for the item. So uh, you may need a budget. Uh, the Law Library Congress also has newspaper archives. So they stopped in 1963. But if you were um, going to give some context to your parents or grandparents as being part of your memoir, that might be a good place to um, start. And certainly, um, I think, as I look at the pictures, most of us were alive in the 1950s. Uh, so it might be helpful. There are lots of archival uh, collections. Wikipedia has a whole list of them. And then there is newspapers.com at ancestry.com now owns them. And you can get a trial um, version for free 
but then there is a subscription price. So anyway, looking at newspapers, and there they are accessible via the internet. Secondly, the big is YouTube. You know, everything is on YouTube. <clears throat> so keeping with my theme of activism, um, I said, okay, well, I remember all those college sit-ins and I remember the University of Wisconsin had one. And uh, so lo and behold, I went into YouTube, I typed in University of Wisconsin uh, protests and up popped a video from 1970. So again, if I was looking for details uh, or to be able to watch this video and then it would refresh my memory or it would give me the details that I could add to my memoir. So don't forget about YouTube. Uh, you probably can find a video that is related to the times that you're writing about. The other is you may be sorting through photographs and you say, okay, maybe your uh, theme is how travel has shaped you as a human being. And some people are very good about labeling their photos. <laughs> Before the digital age, now in the digital age, you, it does it automatically. But if you have boxes of color and white photos like I do, either some from my parents or, or many I took, I say, ooh, I think I know what that is, but I'm not sure. Well, if, if you scan it, and you can do that with your uh, most smartphones, whoops, I'm gonna write that down. Scanners, that's be another topic to have. Most of them have built-in scanners. You get the picture digitized and you go to images.google.com and you simply drag the image. And if it's relatively well known, they will identify it for you. So this picture right here is my photograph. And I dragged it onto Google Images and you see that I got the topic, possible related search Grand Teton, Teton National Park. And I knew that that's where it was, but notice that I got results in 0.83 seconds. And then I got visually similar images. So again, if I am trying to create that sense of place in my memoir, but I'm not quite sure if what I'm looking at is really in place X and not place Y, I can identify it. And the same thing, you can go in um, and uh, look for a picture on the internet and drag it too. So that's another way you can use the internet. So before we go on to keeping everything organized, any questions, comments about using the internet as a tool for memoir writing? Okay, so I do family genealogy research. Not, I mean, it's, it's a very part-time uh, hobby. The issue is I have about 14 notebooks with different notes in them and nothing is at all organized. And so if I were to go to write a memoir, that would also be a problem. I would have bits and pieces everywhere. So how can you keep everything together? And there are some digital tools that you might find helpful. The first one is a site called Live Binders. It's free. It allows you to store all sorts of files in one place. What's cool about it, it can be accessible from any device. So if uh, for example, you're waiting in the dentist's office and you're doing a little searching and you find an image you want, you can immediately send it to Live Binders. It'll be there when you open up your computer. Uh, I said you can, you can um, load websites, images, documents, videos. And so what you're looking at is my table of contents. I used to use this a lot when uh, I was teaching and consulting. I would put all of my resources in a particular binder, but I got rid of them all <laughs> because I don't do that anymore. 
And so I have uh, started a new one called Memoir Writing, which I'm keeping some of uh, my resources in and also uh, some things that if I ever decide to write, I might also use. You'll notice that you can make your binders public. That's up to you. Or you can keep them entirely private. And this one I have as entirely private. Well, what does it look like? Well, once you open it up, you have these series of tabs. And so you see my table of contents. Those are the things I have stored here right now. And then each tab coordinates with one of the things in my table of contents. And if I just want to go to, uh, if I wanted to review the um, website, Five Steps to Memoir Writing, I come right here, click here, and there it is. I don't have to worry about researching, re-looking for it on the internet or searching through all my bookmarks to find it. It's all here in one place. Uh, so if I click on it, this is what I see. I see the title and uh, you see this little arrow there. There, if I were to go through it, that's the website. And uh, Jerry Jenkins is the author and he has a variety of other things. Uh, images, you can see it stores images and it also stores the link where I found them. Uh, this happens to be my great great grandmother who evidently ran a teetotaling um, hotel in northern Pennsylvania and uh, was known to chase anybody tippling uh, out of her hotel with a broom, which I think is kind of fun. Wish I knew more about her. Uh, when you, if I want to upload a document, uh, I can also do that. You see it says text and I just click on there and there's the uh, document. When I want to edit it, there is a little box with a little red pencil. I just click there and this screen pops up and you can see I can upload, I can do link to websites, text, uh, different files, videos, images, QR codes. I can link to um, Google Drive which I'm, and Dropbox, both of which I'm going to talk about. So it is a relatively, um, easy site to use. You can have five binders for free and it is a way where you can keep everything in one place and you can access it wherever you go on whatever kind of device you're on. So that's kind of handy. Now, a second place you might consider is Google Drive. You do need a Google account, uh, but it's free. And I mentioned Google Drive and uh, because some people are shy about their writing and they really don't want to leave it on a computer they share with other people. So if you do it in Google Drive, it's password protected as long as other people don't have your uh, Google password. And uh, you can do, you can compose, you can revise, you can edit, you can share, all knowing that until you're ready to publish, it is secure. Again, you have multiple things you can do on Google Drive, uh, word processing, you can create spreadsheets, you can do presentations, you can upload video and photos. And again, accessible from any device. So here's my Google Drive. And you see the black arrow shows you the different possibilities. So if I want to compose, I can click on Google Docs and I will have a word processing page. But I could also compose on my computer and upload it to Google Docs. 
Um, here are just some other things that you can do. And what you are looking at here behind these two dialog box are my different files. And the way Google Drive is organized, it's my files. Those are things that I have created. And then it also has a section shared with me. So Chris, Ed, and I often will create a document. One of us will create a document in Google Drive, and then we'll share it with the other two. And so we all can access it. So if you had a writing partner, this would be a fantastic way to um, write together. And here's what the word processing looks like. You notice it looks very much like Word. Um, you know, it's got the different options. It's got the font size. Uh, it's got the different font. You can have it right now. It's at 100%. You've got how you format it. And then up here, you see if you decide to share it, you can share it with someone and you can give you control. They may only view it. And so they can't make any comments. They can't edit. You can give them the permission to edit, which means they can change things. Or you might give them uh, permission to make comments. And their comments would show up right here. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, again, alternative. Uh, if your computer is um, full, uh, it is a place that you can write pretty in a pretty unlimited fashion. Now, a third option is Dropbox. And in Dropbox, also free up to an extent, uh, it's secure. I was on a plane and I was sitting next to a lawyer from, well, she lived in Turner, Maine part of the year and then she was in the Carolinas. And she was telling me that their legal association told them that they should go ahead and uh, do their work in Dropbox and to store their documents there. And I said, well, are you paying extra for security? She said, no, uh, which sort of surprised me because they do have a premium, but it's secure. Uh, you has both private and public. You can share things or you can make things public. And again, it allows you to upload all sorts of different types of files. It is a great backup. So if you're writing, um, you want to make sure you're backing up your backing up what you've written. Uh, I'm going to tell a story, uh, and Ed can jump in if he wants. And he, we all have a friend. He wasn't writing an, a memoir; he was writing a book. And the backup where the, the book was stored on one of the thumb drives and they had a new puppy and the puppy ate the thumb drive. And so all that work was lost, <laughs> you can imagine. So both Dropbox and Google Docs are great backups. So that if something happens to your computer, your files are still here. And I have a friend uh, who is a project manager at IDEX, uh, which is a very successful company here in Maine, doing pet meds and things like that. And I said, how do you back up your private files? And he said, he backs them up with Google Drive and Dropbox. So again, that's something to think about is uh, where you have your backup for the work that you do. Because if you had spent hours and hours and then somebody spills a cup of coffee on your computer or there's a lightning struck, strike and the circuit uh, breaker doesn't work uh, and everything's fried, you'd, um, you'd be really upset to have lost all that work. And here again, just shows you um, what the files look like. There's some that I have, you see I've got pictures here I've got a movie um, and I, the three dots always means more. So I can download, I can comment, I can delete, I can see a vision, a version history. Uh, so they are really very handy tools to help you make sure you uh, can 
control your work, you can keep it private if you want, and you have a backup. So any questions about Google Drive or Dropbox or Live Binders? Before we go on? Yes, Henry. Well, it just raises the question a little bit, a side issue, but you know, um, all of the photos that we have on our iPhones and iPads, um, where are they stored? Okay, great question. If in your settings, you have turned on iCloud, your photos are all backed up to Apple's cloud, iCloud. And if you go to iCloud.com on any device, you can see them. Now, here's the thing. If you, for example, on your um, iPhone, delete a picture, it also deletes it in iCloud. Right. Right. However, if you upload those photos to Dropbox or to, uh, I wouldn't, in this case, I'd upload them to Google Photos rather than Google Drive, then eventually you can delete them from your phone or your iPad, but you know that they're safe in another place. So it's, it's two different things, but they are all stored uh, unless you delete them in iCloud. And so now, for example, if you were to buy a new phone or a new iPad, all you have to do is you turn them back, I can't remember the exact directions, you turn them back on, you place them side by side, and yeah. the stuff is automatically yeah. transferred. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if uh, just a little bit of follow up on that. Um, if all my photos are on iCloud, um, is there any real reason for me to um, move them to, to also have, I guess it would be the term, also have them on Dropbox? Um, only if you start to run out of space. If, okay. you get, if you get, and you can buy more space, right. you can buy more iCloud storage, uh, which I've done now three times. <laughs> um, Ooh. Yeah, it's a dollar. Um, I think it's a dollar a month the first time and then maybe three dollars. And now I pay ten dollars a month for what looks to me like pretty much unlimited storage for me. Um, it's a terabyte. So, okay, uh, yep. OK, I had Any a question. Yes. I have a question, Jill, about photos. Um, what happens uh, to all of our photos or memoirs let's say we used to take uh, pictures and put them away and save yeah. them for the grandkids or if they cared and uh so what happens we just give them leave the phone to them or <laughs> any information uh, <laughs> that's you know that is a huge i think yeah. a huge issue yeah. because yeah, right. we yeah. all got hand i mean i have photos from my parents in the third oh, you know and i don't know who half these people are um and I wonder who that man is with my mother, who was not my father. <laughs> well, <laughs> assuming it's before they got married, it was somebody she was dating. Um, so I have those, but the um, the question about for digital pictures is you got to think about. It. I mean, there are now um, the sticks that you can buy. I mean, you can put them on a, a thumb drive, and people can access them. Mm -hmm. well, they also have memory sticks just for photos now. And I keep saying I'm going to buy one. Oh. And out. But I think that that's going to have to be the route. Ed, Chris, any memory sticks? Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling on this end. About 10 <laughs> minutes ago, I wrote down on my little slip of paper here. I said, new course topic. What happens to our online life when we're gone? Yeah. And that's, you you think, wrote that. I think and that's I what that. you're asking, Henry. It's it's a huge issue no, now. Have. And a lot of the stuff just stays out there because nobody's paying attention or we haven't made any plans to do anything else, anything else with it. Will you wait? Um, I had another, uh, so so the eye stick, or what, what did you call it? Just, it's a, it's, um, just a I have to look at the memory, yeah. Yeah. memory stick so we have 10 grandchildren and four great grandchildren so we would then get 10 sticks 
no, 14 sticks. <laughs> Give them out. <laughs> well, yes, yes. But the problem with that too, Anne, is that the technology is changing and you may give them in the stick and four or five years, they may not have a device that accepts the stick. I know. So yeah. that's it. So, uh, so, so another way to think about, you know, your online accounts, Think of them, you know, the same way you would think about a bank account. And so uh, you would want to, you know, ensure that, you know, after you're gone, so that all your accounts don't, you know, get tied up in, in probate, that, uh, that someone, you know, maybe your children or your grandchildren or your executor um, actually has that account information so that they can then, you know, act on your behalf in your absence to, um, you know, give that information to whoever you, you know, deem that should go in your, in your estate. Um, in your estate so that, so that, that's just, uh, you know, that's part of the kind of the, the planning. So your digital world, you know, becomes part of your estate and you yeah. try to plan it that way. Oh boy. That's so if things are up in Dropbox, you make sure that people have your password. And, then and, you, and username. Get... And username. Oh, username, right. Yeah. And keep and keep paying if they're into the paid element, paid uh, Oh yeah, dimension. you would have somebody would have to keep paying, but you can put an awful lot in without paying. Uh, so you might have to be judicious and not upload everything. <laughs> yeah. Just as an aside, um, one, one storage um, quote unquote solution that, that I use is um, the uh, Amazon photos. Uh, with the Amazon photos, um, if you store photos, not videos, but if you store photos, you have unlimited uh, storage. Yeah. So that's so that and 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 I mean it's not free because you have it's it's it comes with Amazon Prime. Mm, so okay. if you're all if you're already paying for Amazon Prime, you're already paying for unlimited photo storage. Yeah. Google Photos is all, is free. And um, though they've just changed their terms, but what they do is they tell you that you, um, if you upload a smaller, if you allow them to store the picture in a smaller version, which I can't tell the difference, then you mm. have unlimited storage. Now, will that change in five years? Who knows, it may. But so Amazon and Google Photos are, again, two possibilities and just leave the, uh, username and password yes, we, we, uh, we may be wandering a little bit here but um, <laughs> um okay so let's imagine that i can have them all on icloud or i can have them on amazon photos or google photos or i guess in dropbox are there any advantages between you know any of those in terms of how they're accessed in terms of the searching and presentation and, and things um I don't think so. I think, I, well, I've never used Amazon, but Google Photos and um, Apple, they're chronologically arranged and you can put them in folders. So uh, let's say you had um, family pictures from a family reunion in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, on those different sites, you could put them into a folder or an album and label it. And so yeah. that makes it, using albums makes the use of a searching form much mm. easier. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Albums, that's it. And you don't have, you have easy storage. Oh. Yeah. So, but it is an issue because like I said, where we all have those shoe boxes of photos uh, dating back to our parents and maybe earlier, uh, the kids aren't going to have that. They're, there's got to be a different solution. As, and as Ed pointed out, um, what works, I mean, think about how we started with um, the tapes, that uh, VCR, 
and now it's DVD and who knows what it'll be um, 10 years from now. Holograph, like on Star Trek, uh, on this um, Captain Picard's uh, Star Trek, where they go to a room and live the adventure. Uh, Jill, just one more quick uh, note here. Henry had, and Anne had a couple great questions about the different kinds of storage devices. You've given us some ideas for some future articles. Um, accessing Amazon Prime versus Google Photos versus um, iPhone Photos. So we'll, we'll use that and move ahead and let you know, Henry. Good questions, thank you. Yeah, they are. And of course you can do a lot of your, st which I'm not doing today, but you could do a memoir as a digital story. Uh, so there's, that's gonna be in the course. Okay, so recording interviews. Uh, anybody that's tried to do an interview and take notes know that it's very difficult to do that. Reporters do it all the time, but unless you have your own shorthand, you know, you really want to get wrapped up into the interview. You don't want to say, no, we just stop, say that again. So what's cool, doesn't matter what kind of phone you have or tablet, they all have the capacity to record. Now on an iPhone, the free app is called Voice Memo. Androids, if you go to the Google Play Store, you have several choices. Just read the reviews. And they're great for interviews as long as you tell people that you're interviewing them. And they're very good these days about being able to pick up conversations in a, uh, a rel not a huge, I mean, not a huge room, but if you're sitting across from somebody on a, a dining room table or a kitchen table, it's not going to be any problem uh, picking up the conversation. Now, there are also apps that will try and transcribe. However, here's the kicker. The app itself is free, but they charge you for the transcription by minute. So therefore, it's really not free. But again, it depends what your situation is. That might be a service that you're willing to pay for. So another good uh, digital tool is remembering your smartphone, especially that you probably always have with you, has a recording device on it. Uh, it's great for interviews. And as a, an aside, you know, if you're going into a doctor's office and you're gonna get um, treatment suggestions, you know, turning on your voice memo or your whichever you're using on your Android, you've got what he or she says. And because you know, when you're listening to descriptions of what you should be doing, um, it's awfully easy to get caught up in being nervous and filter out details that you really should remember. So um, the third uh, tool is the recording apps that come on your phone and your tablet. And uh, this is from the voice memo because I have an iPhone and they're so simple to use. Uh, you start it with a um, start button. It'll be a red circle probably. When you're done, uh, it'll be a square and you just tap that and you can tell whether or not you're recording and whether the sound is good enough because you will see the waves and then it'll be listed. And you know, if you don't want it, you can trash it. Um, if you go to the three dots, which mean more, you can share it. Uh, most of them you could, excuse me, you can edit, ed edit them and you can change. I've just got new recording, <clears throat> but I could change that to, you know, Aunt Helen's interview, um, February 25th, 2021. Uh, so they are really, uh, it's a really handy tool if you're looking for those details that you don't quite remember or you want somebody else's perspective for your uh, memoir. And that, that's an app that's found in your control center on your iPhone or iPad. Absolutely. Okay, now, as I mentioned earlier, when you're writing and you're writing about 
<clears throat> a place. You really want your reader to feel like they're there. And uh, sometimes you remember the details very vividly, other times not so much. However, there is a wonderful tool that can take you right back to that location. And that's Google Earth, uh, where they will take you to the place. Uh, Google Earth, again, there are apps on your iPhone and uh, iPad or your, <clears throat> excuse me, your smartphone and your tablet or on a computer, which I tend to like because it's got a bigger screen when I'm doing this. Uh, I just type in Google Earth and there I go. And it allows you to visit uh, the place that you're writing about. And it, depending uh, where in the world, you often can have a 2D or a 3D and a street view. So for example, this is the house where I grew up. And although you can't see much of it, I was reminded absolutely about the huge pine trees in front. They weren't quite that big uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and I could uh, turn the picture and I could see a side view and so I could, you know, remember the house next door, I'd forgotten that was a brick two family. Uh, I remembered the house on this side. And then this is a street I used to walk down to go to my elementary school. This is Page, uh, Page Road and I had a good friend that lived there. I walked down this sidewalk and my elementary school was right there. And so Google Earth is just really a, a way to go and visit where you've been. And when you open Google Earth, you will see these different icons. And I'm looking at the time. No, I don't want to go live. You've got places that you have searched. You can do a search. Voyager is they have some uh, tours already created that are fun feeling lucky, um, again, they're just kind of a willy nilly. You can save your projects and this is map style. So this is um, Crane Beach where we used to go when I was a kid. And so, you know, if I look at it, I'm reminded how long the beach was. Uh, I don't know that I remember all this stuff, but you know where it is. And then the controls are here. And of course I'm not live, so they're not gonna work. Uh, this gives me, the little person gives me street view. Right now it's on um, 2D, two dimensional. If I were to click on it, it would go to 3D and I would see more of the height. I can change the, um, positioning, compass positioning, uh, and I can make it larger or smaller. Uh, it even gives me the latitude and longitude. So um, it, whoops, just kicked my dog by mistake. Uh, it is a handy tool, again, to refresh your memory. So if you um, want to go back to college days, you can go back to the campus and uh, you don't remember quite what that building looked like. And so you can go look at it and you can add the details to your writing or what building was next to your dorm or which dorm was there um, or how the, when I went to University of Maine, um, you know, there was no such thing as a co-ed dorm. Um, and uh, so, you know, the dorms were often separated by groups so Google Earth, if you've never done it, you ought to try it. Now, the last big item, and I'm looking and it's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to go pretty quickly, is polishing your work. Um, so sometimes you just might have a grammar question, get your grammar correct. Not a, not a grammatically correct statement, but it gets the point across. 
And so there is a site called Grammar Girl Quick and Dirty Tricks. And uh, it's free. She does podcasts. Uh, but there are also posts. And you can ask a question. She'll answer it. So for example, I always forget. I don't know why I can't keep it straight in my mind. Lay and lie. So if I want to go double check that, I just go to Grammar Girl and I type in lay and lie and up pops the explanation. Or should I use a semicolon? You know, the di uh, directions are there. So that's one site that we, your quick grammar questions that you're not sure of, you think you know, but maybe you want to double check before you should put out anything uh, where somebody who is a, a a grammar control freak will call you on it. Uh, for general writing tips, there is the OWL. It's the online, online writing lab from Purdue University. And when I was teaching uh, middle school, often would use this. Even though the audience is college students, they have good advice. And you can see the writing process, uh, types of writing, grammar, punctuation, they have all sorts of information that you can use to uh, make sure that you are using the very best syntax and grammar and spelling for your particular piece. Now, one of my favorites now these days is Grammarly.com, which they have a basic plan, it is free. It gives feedback. So you see over here, uh, I was writing a, uh, I was on, this is on Facebook and I was writing a post and I wasn't paying very much attention. And so I forgot the space and I got a red line under it. And when I moused over it, uh, I got the message, uh, what, the, what the issue was and I could immediately fix it. It works. Um, it depends when you get your account, how you set it up. But I use it on, uh, it works on my Facebook. It will work in Word. I can't get it to work in pages. I'm not sure why. Uh, also, when I do a blog post on WordPress, it also pops in. Uh, it's a great proofreader, especially if you don't have anybody else to proofread. And uh, oh, it works on Google Drive also. So that's something uh, to consider. They do, this is an example, Go Premium. And you can see that they, the yellow here, uh, word choice, tone issues, misuse of semicolons, inappropriate, inappropriate colloquialisms. It will go even further uh, into the grammar and syntax of your writing if you if you care care to pay for it. So uh, a lot of people use it professionally. And like I said, the basic plan is free. Um, I find it very helpful because uh, I tend to write kind of stream of consciousness. And so this catches things immediately when I um, go back and do a proofreading. Um, it's real obvious. Now, the last thing, it just take me a minute, uh, your bonus. Gonna suggest that you might wanna try getting your feet wet with self-publishing with a blog. Um, most of them are free. You can make them private or public. They are relatively easy to set up. You can use text, images, and videos. And just as a um, impetus or a, I don't know, spur you on, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which is a very popular book for middle school kids and has been turned into a movie. It started out as daily installments on funbrain.com because he couldn't get anybody to publish it. Uh, we use WordPress at Boomer Tech Adventures. This is what uh, a post, a blank post looks like adding your title. You see the word processing part. You can add media. Uh, 
you can choose to publish it or not. Uh, but it's a way to sort of get out there if it's a little scary to um, to send off to a publisher or send off to the New York Times or memoir.com, I can try a blog and you might just share it with family by giving them the URL or you might make it public. And you know, chances are most public people in the public are not going to stumble across it, but they might. And uh, so it's just a way, like I said, to get your feet wet and say, eh, do I really want to go beyond just publishing for myself or my family? Am I thinking about doing it for public? So um, that's it. Uh, hopefully, coming late spring, which will probably be May, um, we will have a course and you and our discussion today is giving me some ideas of other things to put in it. Uh, but digital tools to help you tell your story. So I'm going to stop talking because I've been talking for almost an hour and that's way too much. Any Good questions? information. Okay. Questions? Good information, Good information uh, Jill. And uh, it's, this is great. And I really enjoyed your photo course. Oh, good. Taking good. photos of my flowers is just delightful. <laughs> okay, so you want to pop in on Sunday then when Chris does the floor and fauna one. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we will do that. Yeah. Any other questions or especially what do you wish I'd covered that I didn't? Then I'll put them in the course. Mm. We, we pretty much mentioned those along the way, I think. Yeah. Uh, how about Tom? Yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, you can talk a little bit about um, using something like voice memos. I mean, editing and transcribing and, you yeah. know, that's yes, yeah, so that, that would be the, the video mm -hmm. in the course would go into all that. Yeah. That's amazing. I just think there is an incredible amount of tools that we don't know about that help us. I mean, some people might like live binders. Others might like Google Drive. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Depending on what your life is like. Any Tom, other? Tom in Texas, this is Ed. Are you are you are you currently writing? Or are you hoping to? No. The reason I'm I'm here is I my wife uh, was in a nursing home because of uh, Alzheimer's, oh. and um, she passed away in August from COVID. Oh, and, oh. Um, oh no number of the staff, the nurses have asked me to write our love story. Oh. I, I came oh. there, I was there every day to take her to lunch or dinner. I took her out for massages and, and hair appointments and whatever. And then until visitations were canceled Yeah. and the caretaker group I belong to also asked me to write my story and I you know how we met and our our love for each other and I, I hadn't even thought about it and they're they keep calling me and say are you working on that are you <laughs> working work on that and they said well you know we'll buy a copy well I said I don't care if anybody buys it if I do this I'm just going to give it to them yeah you know yeah. I'm not out to put it on the market or publish it it's just for maybe half a dozen copies yeah, that uh, I wanted to learn. I wanted if I do it, I want to do it right. Mm. Uh, I'm still toying with the idea, but I want to do it justice, and uh, that's that's why I'm here because I just it isn't something that would have occurred to me. It's just something that people have asked me to do. Yeah, well, I would think then that the first thing we talked about, which is is reading what the professional writers. Um, will tell you are the components of a good um, memoir. And I think you just mentioned them, things like, uh, you know, an ongoing love story uh, that has, I'm sure, a very romantic starting and, and a, a bittersweet romantic ending that um, in, in this day and age where we're living longer and so many people are dealing with uh, loved ones with memory loss, um, 
that being able to read somebody else's story, I think helps them through their process, which, you know, can be pretty painful. Well, evidently she was telling people about our love story, how much she loved me and how oh. yeah. sick and they just want to hear it. Cause I would go in to pick her up and they'd always say, well, you know, there's the apple of your eye, apple of your eye or yeah. there's the love of your life or whatever. But I, Evidently, oh. I was the only person going in on a daily basis, and I, yeah. it was really sad. But, um, we just were inseparable. Wow, I think you got a story there. There's Ab your theme. Inseparable. Absolutely, I want to read it, Pam. Oh. And, um, and as as a former English teacher, the other thing that I would recommend is just start writing. Yes. Just start writing a little bit every day. Yes, that's yeah. the, the yeah. professional writers. You know, there's a saying, the difference between a writer and a non-writer is the writer writes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, whether it's um, first thing in the morning or late at yeah. night or whatever, like Ed said, a little bit every day. Yeah, mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about getting it right the first time, just get, it, just get the story down. Right, yeah. yeah, I'd like to do this course. Yeah. Well, we'll stay in touch and you stay in touch with us. And, and Jill okay. is, is the lead writer on the course. So she's our expert, but we're glad uh, I'm volunteering Boomer Tech Adventures. We're happy to give any advice anytime or any help. Yeah. Right, yes. well, I've, I've learned a lot here in the last hour or stuff I didn't even know about. Good. Yeah. Now I bet you have pictures that will bring back um, anecdotes that, yeah. yeah. And even, you know, doing something yeah. like a, a blog on a, you know, a single anecdote and then putting them all together. Even if you don't publish the blog, um, Jill, they're kept in one place. I think we know a good place to publish a blog as kind of a memoir in process and talking a little bit about Tom, how Tom got started then let him publish on Boomer Tech Adventures blog. Absolutely. So Ooh. there you go, Tom, you got a place to to start. Mm -hmm. I wonder. <laughs> well, I didn't even thought of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it makes a lot of sense because our our website is aimed specifically at boomers. And uh, you know, as as each year goes goes on, um, you know, our ta target audience actually, you know, gets gets older. <laughs> so so it's going to become more and more relevant, I think, you know, to this, especially this memoir writing process. Mm -hmm. Eventually, that's that's what it will. Be. I mean, it'll all be memories, right? Yeah. Over over time. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Well, I should appreciate. You know, this this is just really great. Oh, good, good. Well, we're Thank glad you. you came. And again, um, as we always say. You we come to it. one of our sessions and it's a lifetime guarantee. So you can, you got edit Boomer Tech Adventures or any of us and uh, happy to uh, encourage or to answer questions, et cetera. Um, we, we don't want to scare you, but we know where you live. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good thing. Seriously, yeah. we, will, we will get back to you about that. Okay. And, Anne and, and Henry, we know that you're writers too. So we would extend that invitation to you two as well. And I definitely know where you live. I've been to your house. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, this is a great, great idea for, uh, you know, staying in touch with people, seeing people being involved, you know, senior college classes were, you know, uh, just wonderful this winter. And we were tickled to death to find out about, you know, you guys were doing yeah. photography class and whatnot so it's been it's been great so hang Good. in there Good. Tom start writing <laughs> thank you Good. all right there you go all right good to meet you all thanks, thanks everybody thank for joining us thanks for joining us today this is Ed Brzee and for my colleagues Jill Spencer and Chris Toy we appreciate your letting us know about how Boomer Tech Adventures courses and workshops helped you learn more about your iPhone, iPad, and Mac computer. If you like this workshop, you'll love our full course on memoir writing by Jill Spencer.
that will be finished later in the spring of 2021. Like our other courses, it will be a self-paced course that will allow you to work at your own speed. The course is yours to use as long as you want, and remember that you have us, Jill, Chris, and Ed, to ask if you have any questions or issues. We currently have eight other courses uh, with more in the works. As you can see, courses like Intro to Mac, Macintosh, Intro to Zoom, um, Intro to iPhone, several photography courses, and others. We are available at several locations. Our website, as you can see here, we have an active YouTube channel with over 100 videos. Uh, we're active with tips on Facebook. And please don't hesitate to contact us anytime at our email, ed at boomertechadventures.com. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.